What is the definition of narcissism? Yeah, it's a lot more nuanced and detailed than people think. Narcissism, in essence, is a, when you're talking about a narcissist, this is a person who lacks empathy, is entitled, grandiose, arrogant, they're validation and admiration seeking, they're, um, they're very sensitive to criticism, they are not able to regulate their emotions, particularly rage when they're stressed or disappointed, they, are very, they can be very controlling, and, but underneath it all, they're deeply insecure. So all these things we see, the entitlement, the arrogance, all of it, they're simply almost like protections of this insecurity. Is it possible to have a healthy narcissism, a healthy kind of self-regard? I don't like the term healthy narcissism, and I'll tell you why. I, I like the term healthy self-regard. I like the term healthy self-advocacy. I'll even take healthy assertiveness. Narcissism at its core is an antagonist pattern, right? These are people who are not self-reflective, who do not account for other people. So I think when people get lost in the healthy narcissism term, I think what they mean are people who have the capacity at times to put their own needs first, you know, to be able to say, okay, I am going to today I'm or in this next endeavor, I'm really going to choose what I think works best. But they're also going to take account for the other people. They may even say, listen, I know this is not going to work for all of you. I'm telling you, I'm aware of that. I apologize for that. You know, they'll take accountability. Doesn't mean that the other people are necessarily going to feel better about it, but there seems to be an awareness. Narcissism in general, the person is so egocentric and egotistical that they really don't ever take account for how their own self-focus is impacting other people. And frankly, they don't care. So I don't know that that's ever a healthy condition. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes it's not that they don't care, they're not even aware of it. Yeah, and, and by and large, you're not aware of it. And that's one thing that people forget about with narcissism is that there is a sort of what we call a lack of self-reflective capacity. They're not able to stop and think and be aware, wow, this thing I just said, this thing I just did, it could hurt someone else, it did hurt someone else. By the time they come to that realization, if they come to that realization, it's as though people had to coach them and let them know they don't come to it automatically. Yeah. We'll come to a few of the specifics in just a moment. But have you been surprised how much this topic has resonated with people? You said there was a kind of real thirst for information for it. Have you been surprised that your work has taken such a focus in this area? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how how wide reaching it is, yes and no. And I'll tell you why. I, I'm surprised maybe they're, they're listening to me. There's a lot of people talking about it. That's just my own neurosis. But I have to say that this is an area where the mental health field is coming up short. So I think a lot of people go into therapy with a relationship problem or a family problem. And they're given sort of the tried and tired, I should say, really the tired and true kinds of advice of like, well, work on communication and everyone in the interaction should take responsibility and maybe you need to see their point of view. And people kept trying to do that and they're saying, oh my gosh, nothing I'm doing is getting anywhere with this other person. So they start blaming themselves. And once they got educated on this pattern of narcissism, all of a sudden the light bulb went on. And it was interesting to me that the mental health field wasn't willing to take this on. So I think that a lot of the problem was there's traditionally been nowhere to get this information. And I hate to say it, this pattern societally is becoming more normal. And I have to tell you, I pin that to a few things. And a few things, namely, a lot of this is sort of social media and reality TV, the sort of the idea of the outlandish life that's put on display and that an entire life is based on how many likes a person gets or how much admiration they get that was that's been a major shift in the last 20 to 25 mm -hmm. years and that's about the period of time we've really seen a steady uptick in narcissism though writers like Christopher Lash who I think wrote probably one of the best books on narcissism which I'll talk about later he wrote in the 1970s and in the 1970s what Christopher Lash was saying about narcissism was it was it was almost like he was a, a soothsayer. He really predicted what we were headed to. But at the time, I don't think people were only like academic audiences were listening to him at the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got so many questions around narcissism and even kind of working out whether the people in your life are narcissistic or not. But I felt like a good approach with you would be to ask you 
What is the one or two, what are the one or two questions that people most often come to you with? What are the kind of stumbling blocks around this issue that people just cannot get past and are desperate for answers around? The main question people ask me is, what am I doing wrong? So they're in a relationship with a narcissist and they keep asking, what could I do differently? How, what could I, how can I make this better? And I have to give them the rather, you know, sad guidance of nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it just happens to be you're the one stuck in this situation now. I could, I could change you out with anyone. You're replaceable in this equation and they'd be behaving the same way. Because I think everyone thinks that the narcissist would put on a better show or treat someone else better than they are them. And what is confusing is the narcissistic personality style is very two-faced. They can put on a very nice public face. They can be at the party. They can hold court. They can be the brilliant salesperson. They can be charming. They can be charismatic. And then once you're behind closed doors with them, you're really dealing with somebody who can be quite monstrous. And that disconnect would leave a person close to them saying, this has got to be me because they're charming with everyone else. Well, the reason they're charming with everyone else is that those are sort of lower stakes, short term kinds of quickly get the validation and run relationships. They're not accountable to those people. Those people don't expect anything from them. And that's why they're able to be two-faced. A healthy human being, though, has deeper relationships. And so they're much more self-aware and they're able to monitor their, their, their behavior both in public settings and in private settings. It's not how it works for a narcissist. So th that's probably the biggest question is, what am I doing wrong? To which my response is nothing. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there, but, I mean, that's... Um... That's a bit gutting, isn't it, as well? Well, there's nothing you can do to change it. No, there's nothing you can do to change it. Nothing I can do to change it. I'm a therapist. I mean, it's supposed to be my job to yeah. help people make these shifts. And we really don't have good clinical evidence that this is a pattern that's amenable to change. Now, I'll be frank with you, though. I get a lot of emails from the narcissist. Some angry, some, frankly, very sad. And people will say, sorry, People will say, I've watched your videos and I have seen like myself in your videos. Like I think I might be the narcissistic person. Yeah. And they'll say, but the main theme you're giving is that we can't change. Now, I, this is well, the reason I say it is it's almost like somebody says, hey, I want to lose 90 pounds, right? The research is pretty clear that the majority of people, the majority of people, who try to lose that amount of weight and maintain that weight loss is small. It's very, very small, right? Mm -hmm. But if a person actually commits to eating well, exercising, you know, uh, being careful about their food choices and doing that every single day of their lives, not only can they lose the weight, they can keep it off. Now, for a lot of people, are, they're saying, well, I like my fast food and I like my junk food. And I'm like, well, then you're not going to lose and keep the weight off. You know, it, this is about a daily, hourly, meal by meal choice. So if we apply that to a narcissist, it's the same thing. I will tell narcissistic individuals because I work with them in my practice. I say to them, hey, listen, you, every time you're with a person, you need to take the time, be aware of their feelings, be mindful, think about how your words affect other people, be interested in other people, have empathy for other people, recognize you're not special and don't need to be at the head of the line. And they look at me and they say, I can't do this. Hmm. And I'll say, well, then there's your answer. You see what I'm saying? So it's yeah. like, the, it's, it's clear what they need to do, but it's almost like telling someone, you need to leave all your junky foods and your breads and all of that aside and you need to walk three miles a day, they're like, yeah, and no, I'm not going to do that. And say, so then you're not going to lose the weight and keep it off. Like, mm. I mean, it's, it's just, I'm just telling you the facts here. So to pull somebody out of the narcissistic swamp, it means that that narcissist has to do daily work. I can count on one hand in my 20 years of clinical practice, the number of people who've been able to pull that off. Right. Wow. Um, and amongst your followers, how hard is it for people to come to terms with because narcissism is a very strong label isn't it it's a very it's a very harsh word and you know and and for mm -hmm. very good reason how hard is it for people to come to terms with the fact that they might be in a relationship the person that they quote love might be a narcissist i mean it's um must be quite a, a shift sometimes for people it depends on the person. I, I think it's almost like there's two groups. There's one group that's often very relieved. You know, they're saying, okay, 
I've now talked with you. Here's the pattern. And what's interesting, people will even come into my sessions. They'll bring in emails. They'll bring in voicemails and voice recording. So it's not just their story. They're actually bringing in substantiation. And it's pretty darn clear what's going on. I can't diagnose someone I haven't met, but I can certainly look at sort of someone's behavior and say, yeah, this is pointing in that direction. Many, many people are relieved. They're saying, you know what? This feels better because now I know it's not me. The, uh, you know, there is a group of people who get a little it really does remove some of the hope from this. Like the odds of it changing are pretty slim, but I'll be frank with you by the time people are coming to this realization that their mother, father, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever is narcissistic. They have been suffering for years in this relationship and they have tried everything. They've tried therapy. They've tried making their needs known. They've tried communicating more clearly. They've tried writing letters. They've tried everything and nothing has worked. And so that, that's the challenge is, you know, if you're, it's people realizing that I need some sort of framework to get this. And I'm amazed as a psychologist, how many people are simply relieved especially when it's relationships like family members, a parent, for example, that you're not going to divorce or break up with, that they say, you know, I don't know that I want to cut my parents out of my life completely. However, now I am able to put up some pretty strong boundaries and I now know how to manage them and I'm going to stop turning to them for something they're never going to be able to give me. Yeah. Wow. Um, you wrote an article that there's a very helpful section on your website and it's in the press and you've written some excellent articles for Oprah magazine and there's, there was one that I particularly enjoyed for Vice and it's about how mm -hmm. to argue with a narcissist <laughs> um, and there's some great stuff in there you talk about word salads um, and that will yeah. be that'll be listen that's not just relevant to narcissists it's relevant to anyone who's been involved in a frustrating argument isn't it but um, mm -hmm. the stuff about word salad is brilliant when it, and you end up talk, arguing about something completely different from the, what you thought you were arguing about in the first first place. Yeah. So word salad is, you know, for people who it's almost like anyone who's experienced word salad will say, oh, I didn't know there was a term for that, <laughs> that, you know, you, you get into this conversation with somebody and then the conversation may heat up and trying to have some accountability. And before you know it, it has completely like the person is just talking and talking and talking and talking. And each by itself, each sentence may actually even be making a point but all together, it is completely deflated from the original argument. And that, that point of deflection and confusion all goes into the much bigger topic of gaslighting, which is a central, central element of every narcissistic relationship, is the gaslighting is intended to confuse a person and deny a person's reality. So if you said to me, Hey, you know, you're, I don't know what I, I, you said something to me about yourself. We were friends and I'd say, Oh, Tony, you're, you're being too sensitive right in that moment. I disrespected you because I was almost telling you your feelings aren't valid. Your feelings are too much or your feelings are too little or whatever they are. I was, I disrespected you. Now you're leaving that conversation saying, well, maybe I am too sensitive. She's a doctor after all. And you know, maybe she knows something. So I've not done you any favors. It's very unkind to doubt someone's reality. And word salad does that by confusing a person. But what it does for the narcissist is it, it shields them from shame. The last thing a narcissist ever, ever wants to be is wrong. Because if they're wrong, then their insecurity comes out that people are going to see that they, they aren't all that really. And so they're always trying to shield that. So once a person has an argument with a narcissist and starts pointing out some of their deficits, like, Hey, you're always late or you never do your part of what you say you're going to do. Or you often, you're always telling me lies or your stories don't add up or whatever it is. This is showing something about the narcissist that the narcissist doesn't want the world to know. So they're going to do everything in their power to deflect someone from seeing that, including things like word salad or anything else designed to confuse the conversation. Yeah. So what is, um, what is really the definition of gaslighting again? So gaslighting is when a one person denies another person's reality and it can be do it can be through various ways. They may minimize a person's feelings. You're being too sensitive or you know you're making too big a deal out of this. They may literally deny something that happened. They might say something like I never said that. Um they may um 
you know, they, they may literally try to twist a, a, almost a factual situation and say, well, that's your point of view. Um, they might all, and, and, but in a very dismissive way. And then they may also paint you as being disturbed. They'll say, wow, it seems like somebody here is crazy. And so all of these things are designed to leave a person with a sense of self, not only self-doubt, but really denial of their own reality. Like, maybe I did get it wrong. Maybe they never did say that. Maybe I am making too big a deal out of this. And then what ends up happening is, if you're in the presence of gaslighting enough, not only do you become confused and full of self-doubt, you start gaslighting yourself. You're like, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And you can see how people who have spent years and years in relationships with narcissists, every decision becomes a challenge for them because they start second guessing themselves. So if you had narcissistic parents, this is something that started early in life for a person. And that's why many people who had a narcissistic parent or a narcissistic parent, both of them, go into adulthood always having trouble making decisions and needing reassurance and doubting themselves right yeah what um what is the line between somebody who's a little bit dysfunctional and a narcissist because some of these behaviors that you're talking about we probably all do a little bit some of the time you know i mean hopefully not much of it but maybe a touch of it every once in a while so it, narcissism's on a continuum. It's not an either or, right? There's some people who are more or more or less stubborn. There are people who are more or less agreeable or friendly. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like you're you're friendly or you're not. You're stubborn or you're not. It's on a continuum. And so at the sort of most mild, I'd almost say benign levels of narcissism, you might talk about that person who's very superficial. It's all about the selfies. It's all about what kind of car do you drive or where did you take your holidays or anything like that? It's, it's that sort of kind of like very superficial, very sort of selfish, egocentric, self-serving, ridiculous kind of a person, but without that sort of malignant, gaslighty, antagonistic, manipulative feel to it. Mm. As you go higher up on that spectrum, you get to people who are very manipulative, very exploitative, you know, very, um, very gaslighty, uh, very much taking advantage, lying, cheating, stealing kinds of people. So it's on a continuum. What we look at is how pervasive it is in a person. Does it cut across all areas of their lives? How stable is it? So you might be talking about, let's say you're talking about a guy who, you know, he was just a fun guy and always wanted to have fun and meet, you know, meet people and all of that. And, and, oh, and he, and then everyone grew up and had families and careers and all of that. And he's able to have his family and he's able to have his career. But when he gets back together with his college friends, he continues to act like a fool. Someone like that, I wouldn't be as likely to call him narcissistic. Like if he, if his spouse was saying, no, he's a perfectly fine guy and he's empathic and he's a good dad but then he acts like an idiot with his college friends I wouldn't call that narcissism if that makes sense it's sort of very very sort of walled off but yeah. if when it's not walled off when it is pervasive in all situations that's when we're really talking about something that's more of a narcissistic pattern but that's why Tony that that lack of empathy is so much the core of it because there are people out there let's say you're talking about somebody who grew up with a lot of wealth or power, or even celebrity and fame, right? Those people are very used to the world working on their schedule, walking right up to the fancy jet and getting on it, not having to wait in the line, the VIP treatment. They're accustomed to that. So they may seem sort of a bit more entitled because they're used to things running a certain way, but they may have fully preserved empathy, walk into a situation and say, ah, you know what? I see there's other people in line. They should have their turn first, even though they're accustomed to it. So the lack of empathy becomes the core because every, to me, all the other planets orbit around that. Some people might have bits and pieces of the entitlement. They have bits and pieces of the sort of ridiculous, superficial validation seeking the social media person who needs always like my nonsense. It's, it, th those things may be happening. But if the empathy is preserved, I'm a little less likely to label that as narcissism. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's just um, it's so intense, isn't it? Being in the company of a narcissist that the, the gaslighting that you were talking about is utterly exhausting just a quick reminder that this podcast is brought to you by magnesium breakthrough did you know there's one phase of sleep that almost everybody fails to get enough of and this one phase of sleep is the most important one it's important for rejuvenation and repair controlling hunger 
weight loss hormones as well, even boosting energy. And this podcast is all about energy. And I'm talking about the deep sleep phase, which apparently almost all of us don't get enough of. I measure it every night on my Oura ring and I get very frustrated when I haven't had enough. If you don't get enough deep sleep, you'll probably struggle with cravings and slow metabolism and maybe even premature aging as well. And a big reason for not getting enough deep sleep is magnesium deficiency. Over 80% of the population are deficient in magnesium. That is why I always supplement with magnesium every day. Magnesium breakthrough. It increases GABA, which encourages relaxation at a cellular level. And I've known for a long time that it just helps me sleep better. Take magnesium in the evening, take a magnesium supplement, it helps you sleep better. Now, before you go out and buy a magnesium supplement, it's important to understand that not all magnesium products are created equal. And uh, in reality, your body needs all seven forms of magnesium especially when it comes to sleep. And that is why Magnesium Breakthrough are our podcast partners. And that is why I take Magnesium Breakthrough. I'm taking it every day. Funnily enough, my deep sleep scores on the Oura Ring are better than ever before. So I'm quite pleased with that. Up to, I mean, I don't want to humbly brag too much, but up to about two and a half hours of deep sleep every day on the Oura Ring. So, if you would like to try Magnesium Breakthrough, they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee, free shipping on selected orders as well, and you can get 10% off Magnesium Breakthrough by using the code ZESTOLOGY10. So, 10% off Magnesium Breakthrough by using the code ZESTOLOGY10. It is the best aid I know for boosting deep sleep. Make sure you go to bioptimizers.co.uk, use the code Zestology 10. You can go to bioptimizers.com if you're anywhere else in the world. Use the same code and uh, Zestology 10 will help you with your sleep, help you create more GABA and help you to encourage relaxation at a cellular level. Right, back to the show. What kind of people do you get uh, in touch with you and, and what and, and how do you do you deal with private clients as well? I do work with private clients, though right now we're sort of booked up way, well into 2021, so that's getting harder just because, yeah, so I can't see a lot in a given week. So it's a, you know, I do, as the world opens up more too, there'll be more seminars and speaking engagements and all of that. We do do things virtually. I'm starting, the university for me opens this week, so I'm kind of getting my legs back under me, and then I'll do, I'll be doing more of the speaking arrangements and things. That's why I put out the YouTube content I put out, because it's a way to, honestly, a lot of the videos I develop come out of people's questions because what mostly is happening is I think that what I, I sort of hate one thing I have to do for a living, which is people hate recognizing that they've just spent 10, 20, 30 years in a relationship. Yeah. And it was all just sort of with this very careless, selfish human being. And, you know, and I try to, I try to bring it back always because I'm a big fan of kindness and compassion. I'm, but I'm not a fan of enabling. So, and to me, those are two very different things because people will say, well, the narcissist doesn't know or they're a damaged person. So maybe we shouldn't be so hard on them. Yes, we should be hard on them. I absolutely think that every human being, unless they're severely psychotically mentally ill, every human being has the, compa has the capacity for mindful, clear thought, intentional behavior and awareness of how their behavior impacts other people. That may be harder for some people, but I don't think, you know, for example, I don't think anyone should be deliberately cruel to a narcissist, even if they're being deliberately cruel to you. So I'm not a fan of that. I am a fan of boundaries and stepping away, but some people will take the attitude of, oh no, you shouldn't even step away from the narcissist. That's not very nice to them. I said, no, I'm not, I'm never going to support someone enabling the narcissist because the narcissist needs an audience at all times. They always need an audience. And when that audience goes away, that's when they become very uncomfortable and they become very sad and they become very angry. And so I think that for people, it's that sense of, no, you didn't have the parent or parents you wanted. Yes, this relationship in many ways is a farce. No, you're not going to get advanced in this job. Yes, these people will always make more money than you. These are very uncomfortable truths, but I think people have to engage in some form of acceptance or they're constantly going to be pushing the rock up the hill just to have it come rolling back down again. Yeah, yeah. And then it comes back to that scale, doesn't it? Which is, it's quite hard to know it might be quite hard for people that you work with to know whether the 
uh, whether the people they love are further down the scale, in which case there's some hope, or further up the case, in which case there's no hope. And that's, I suppose, the, the big work in working it out. I would say, you know, I put that a little bit differently. I'd say even at the lower end of the scale, it's not necessarily about hope or lack of hope. It's about damage that they can do. So that more superficial selfie, look at me on vacation, you know, Instagram person, they're ridiculous. But I have to say that can be a very exhausting relationship. If you're married to this person and you're trying to raise kids with them and they're actually more concerned with how their filter looks on their picture than helping get children ready for school, that's actually just as exhausting perhaps for someone who is with a more wicked narcissist, but who may be instead their boss. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. And if that sort of very superficial, benign-ish narcissist is saying, how dare you call me out? I'm not doing anything wrong. Maybe you're jealous of me. Then all of a sudden, and they're not changing, that might actually be taking just as much of a toll on that person the, in the relationship, the other person, as in a more severe case of narcissism. So I actually think that instead of viewing it as potential for change, it's really the level of damage. Now, obviously, somebody who wants to spend all day taking selfies and being on Instagram and say, you know, don't I look nice in my bathing suit or whatever the heck it is, you know, that's ridiculous. At the higher ends of the narcissism spectrum where people might be cheating, lying, taking your money isolating you from the world. Obviously, those patterns are more psychologically dangerous. But if for some reason, all of a sudden, a person at that higher end decided that they wanted to like make some changes, it's that willingness of the narcissist to say, this isn't okay. Like my behavior has resulted in everyone around me getting hurt. I've got to make some changes. I don't like what I've become. Then the hope is really in that recognition rather than the severity. Yeah, and I saw you say that, you know, it's it's ultimately it's not necessarily about labels, whether someone's narcissist or not, but it's mm -hmm. whether they are empathetic, whether they'll listen to you, whether they validate your experiences yes. and whether when the when when it go when the tough gets going and you really need someone in your life, whether they're there. Right. And this is where a lot of people get confused in narcissistic relationships. Narcissistic people are great when you're dating. They're attractive. They're charismatic. They're fun. Dating is often very exciting. There's travel. There's fun nights out. Everyone thinks your lives are really cool and fun. The sex is always fantastic. Like It's this very sort of often big, big picture, but it's not real life. And as soon as life starts becoming a little bit real, it's not as interesting. It's waking up early to go to work. It's having to make a compromise around a late meeting. It's all those little things that are real life. All of a sudden, that narcissistic partner becomes a lot more uncomfortable and the relationship starts to become more uncomfortable. But a lot of people get lost in, but we had so much fun. This has to still be fun, right? It's just a bad day. We'll get past this bad day. And before you know it, you lift your head and you've been suffering through a succession of bad days. That's the problem. They're great for the front end. The first six weeks to two months, exciting. The next 50 years, a nightmare. Why, why is that? Why are they not so likely to respond to you when you need them the most? Because they're not interested. It's not, it's not self-serving for them. Help, you know, if I was in a relationship with you and I had to make a comp and I was the narcissist, right? And I had to make a compromise because you had to work late. Well, I planned on having dinner with you. You're inconveniencing me. That's not going to work for me. You know, so how dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Yeah. And yet you're my, if, you're, if you were in a relationship with me, I should say like, wow, he's working really hard. This is his ambition. He, we almost never miss dinner. No, if it inconvenienced me, the entire frame of reference for the narcissist is the self. And so they don't, they can't look beyond it saying, oh, they have to work late because this is, they have a big deadline or they have to work late because people are out sick or whatever it is. It's always, well, this is affecting me. I don't care about it. Anybody else. Right. Yeah. Um, Dr. Romney, it's, it's fantastic to talk to you. And I, and I know a lot of people will be taking notes and, and having a long think about, uh, <laughs> about their own lives. Um, what, the two questions that I always ask people are, um, what is one book that you would recommend and one tip mm -hmm. for living with more energy and vitality? So I would say that, you know, a couple of books I'd recommend. You know, one, a lot of people say, what's the antidote to, to narcissism or narcissistic abuse? And I'd say, you know, 
for uh, the antidote to all mental health, I often think is finding meaning and purpose in life. So I would say, honestly, the one book every human being should have read is Man's Search for Meaning oh, yeah. by Viktor Frankl. To me, that's probably one of the most important books that's ever been read because you know, Frankel says, you know, basically astutely says, don't go out and look for suffering. Trust me, it's going to find you. But when it does finally land, it's really your, your ability, how you think about it, that and take responsibility of it and understand you can make choices with it, even if you can't get out of the situation. I mean, remember, Frankel was writing from that perspective of the concentration camps. Even if you can't get out of the situation, there are ways of thinking about this to carve away some tiny bit of freedom or sense that I am a human being that has some capacity for choice that returns your humanness to you, which a lot of people in narcissistic relationships feel is taken from them. So I think that that's a very, very important book. And then, of course, you know, Christopher Lash's Culture of Narcissism. To me, if you really care about this stuff academically, I can't say enough good things about it. His writing in it was some of the most um, prescient work you know, in narcissism written in the 70s, and it could have been written today and been, you know, absolute brilliance. In fact, in some ways, that book came out probably about 40, 50 years too soon. So those are two books I would definitely recommend. And then what was the other question you'd ask me? Well, the other question is, um, I mean, they both sound, well, the uh, Man's Search for Meaning, by the way, is the most ever recommended book on this podcast. So so, so if anyone hasn't read it, um, I yeah. would recommend that they do. And And actually, it's the second time in about a week that I've done an interview and someone's recommended it. So I think I'm going to go back and read it again because yeah. <laughs> it's been a few mm-hmm. years. Um, and mm-hmm. um, and it is just so thought provoking, isn't it? So thank you for recommending that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second one was about energy and vitality. What would be yeah. your one recommendation for people l- to live with more energy? I'm going to be honest with you. To live with more energy, I would start cleaning out the toxic people from your life because they are energy suckers. So yeah, obviously I'm going to say the tried and true, get enough sleep, eat well, be active. Yeah, that's all good and well. But frankly, if you could remove the toxic people from your life, the people who are your naysayers, the people who are your underminers, the people whom after you talk to them, you feel depleted. If you can't eliminate them entirely, set boundaries. People spend so much time removing the junk food from their life and the cigarettes from their life and the alcohol from their life and to good effect. Why wouldn't you remove probably one of the worst toxic stressors, which is toxic people? Take some time, figure out who that is, remove them from social media feeds, stop interacting with them voluntarily, engage with them minimally or get rid of them entirely. Yeah, that's I actually recently discovered the mute button on Instagram. Yeah. It's it's very mm-hmm. liberating, I have to say. It's mm-hmm. it's and yeah. it's amazing yeah. the difference in internal dialogue when I go on Instagram yeah. now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can do it. Those mute buttons. I mean, we don't have them in real life. But I do think there's also a sense of empowerment that's like, no, I don't need to see this kind of ugly discourse anymore. I just don't need this. And it's not it's not a it's not an indictment of that human being, but of their words and how they express themselves. And I will you know, leave people really saying this is that we put 90% of our psychological effort and bandwidth into the people who are the most difficult and toxic in our lives and only put 10% into the healthy, uplifting, authentic, wonderful people. Why? Because those people are going to stay around no matter what because they're good people. we got to flip the mask. Yeah. Cultivate those healthy relationships and just give the minimum to the toxic folks because they're just going to, they, they will take and take and take from you till there's nothing left of you. That's great. Um, Dr. Romney, I've got one more question for you and that is, how often do you get asked about Donald Trump? <laughs> every day, every day, and it's sort of 10 times a day going into the election. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, when I wrote my book, Don't You Know Who I Am, How to Stay Sane in an Era of Narcissism, Entitlement, and Incivility, that book w- was slightly born out of that presidency. When I started seeing what was happening, I thought, oh, no, this is not going to end well. It, it has, it, even if I got beyond his politics, of course, I, someone like me is not going to agree with his politics, but it's just his, his who he is as a person. Because when you take a person like that and put them in a position of leadership, in essence, what you're doing is you're saying this kind of behavior is acceptable. You enable this behavior in society at large. And you know, obviously, he's a world leader. There are many other world leaders like this. There are many CEOs. There are many celebrities. There are many world-class athletes. These people have massive platforms. They're all behaving in very narcissistic manners. And what that does is it communicates to the rest of the population, it's perfectly fine to behave this way. And this is another reason we're seeing such a proliferation of this. Yeah, well said. Um, 
Thank you so much for coming on Zestology. My um, pleasure. You, you My mentioned pleasure. your book. The website is dr ramanicom and um, your yes. YouTube is brilliant as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yes, please. All the answers to this and much, much more I'll sit <laughs> yeah. If people want, and yeah, and I also have another book, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist, which is very much designed for people who are in sort of a marriage or an intimate romantic relationship with a narcissist, very much cuts to the core of that issue. Whereas my other book gets at the whole spectrum of narcissistic relationships. Great. Thank you so much. Really good to chat to you. Thank you, Tony. Take care. That's it. Thanks to Dr. Ramani. And thank you for listening to Zestology. I'm, I'm still down here by the river in West London. What a lovely place to be on such a lovely afternoon. The seal is still sunbathing, which is good. And um, a quick reminder that this podcast for the final week is sponsored by Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the last time it's going to be sponsored by Magnesium Breakthrough, at least for a little while. Um, been a brilliant sponsor and I am still taking magnesium breakthrough every single day in fact I just had my supplements before I came out Um, you can take it in the afternoon or the evening definitely helps me with sleep with kind of easing aches and pains and um, feeling a little bit more relaxed in life it probably helps with loads of other stuff as well but those are the things that I definitely notice more than any other Um, and if you want to use magnesium breakthrough you can use the code zestology10 whether you are in the UK or anywhere else in the world. If you're in the UK, head to bioptimizers.co.uk and if you're in the US, then head to bioptimizers.com. Use the code ZESTOLOGY10 when you get your magnesium breakthrough and that will get you 10% off. And I genuinely think you will notice the difference using magnesium breakthrough. Do you know what I might do this afternoon? I might make like a seal and head home and have a little bit of a chill out in the sun. But that is it for this week's podcast. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, a couple of Zestology favourites. I know you love Donna Lancaster and Brett Moran. Uh, they've been they've both been on the podcast a few times before. They are both absolutely fantastic. They are inspiring and motivating and great company in equal measure. They're the opposite of an energy vampire. They give you energy just by spending time in their company and listening to them and and hanging out with them. So I'm very lucky to be able to be friends with them and and chat to them. And and, um, I think you're quite lucky to listen to them on Zestology as well. (laughs) All right. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time.